Good afternoon, everyone. So good to see you this fine summer. A happy uh, summer. Uh, June gloom is a thing. I left uh, the East Coast to avoid the cloudy weather, but apparently June is gloomy. It's better than the other way around on back east where June starts to begin the sunshine. It's the opposite here, but it is affecting uh, my psychology a bit, and we're going to talk about that because we're going to be talking about sloth um, and how to overcome it. Uh, but before we begin, just thank you for the worship band. Thank you for Joe and Gail. Thank you for everyone here at this church. Uh, we are approaching the 20th anniversary of CFTN, and this is kind of a 20th anniversary uh, campaign to just make sure we launch 2025 in a manner that just lets us flourish and grow and scale. And, and as, as Joe said, uh, the trends are going up, numbers are going up. So we just got to keep at it um, and, and keep doing our part, each and every one of us. Uh, I am going to be meeting with different church networks to kind of plug us in to get some support, so some prayers for that specifically to see what might be a good fit, and I'll bring it to our board, see if there fits. Uh, there's other stuff we're doing. Uh, if you know anyone who likes supporting churches or anyone you want me to meet with who might want to join a church, I would love to meet with them in person. Uh, at the end of the day, Day, our objective is just to get people to Christ and to serve him with each other's gifts and talents. So let's keep at it, church. We're in the right direction, and we're going to keep going forward as a community as we talk about one of the enemies to getting the work done today, which is sloth. Um, also, if you're brand new and would like to fill a Connect card, feel free to uh, fill out your information. If you're not getting the emails by any chance, also, please give us your email because we are sending uh, about a weekly email giving updates on what's happening. So um, if you're new and you want to get up to date on the announcements and all the activities, uh, please provide one of us with these uh, Connect cards or uh, just feel free to just speak to me afterwards and just well, I'll take down your email. So with that said, let me pray and then we're going to continue our series on the seven deadly sins. Last week we talked about pride. This week, we're going to talk about sloth. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for CFTN. I thank you for that you're a God at work, and you're still at work, and you're working in us, through us, and you want us to co-labor with you. So Lord, help us understand this concept of work. Help us overcome whatever roadblocks that might be in our souls that prevent us from doing what you have called us to do. So Lord, I just pray right now as we talk about this topic let it be honoring to you. Let it be glorifying to you, Lord. I just ask that you continue to convict our souls, unite us as one body, your church. Uh, Lord, we look to you right now. We want to give you the glory. We want to give you the praise. We want to give you all our zeal and our efforts. So Lord, be with us as we are about to hear from the word of God. Help these words that are about to be proclaimed. Let it be more of you, less from me. Do what you need to do, Lord. Let your name get all the glory. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so we're going through the seven deadly sins, and there's the seven deadly sins of social media. <laughs> so for those single people who are part of the hookup culture, they use Tinder for lust, right? You swipe right, and there you go. Someone's delivered at your doorstep. Uh, it's awful. It's awful. Um, it's a, that's a whole other talk. In August, we are probably going to be doing an event uh, for how to date as a single person in L.A., uh, that's going to be a fun event um, in August 22nd. It's a tentative date. More, more to be announced there. Uh, my wife was a professional uh, matchmaker in New York City for a couple of years. We have a lot of fun stories uh, uh, with that. So anyway, uh, if, if social media was uh, the seven deadly sins, Tinder would definitely be lust. Yelp would be gluttony. You know Yelp has a Yelp review, and it's not good because Yelp is not a good company. It's a true story. Uh, greatest LinkedIn, you know, people are always trying to connect. You're always like spammed with maybe an insurance company or some coach on LinkedIn. Uh, it's, it's about networking and, and, and business. Uh, sloth, Netflix, you know, just Netflix. I, I totally binge watched something yesterday. It was on uh, TikTok dance videos and a church that was a, led by a cult leader. It was very disturbing. It was called Dancing with the Devil. It was, it, it was in LA too. It was really disturbing. But I totally like lost track of time, <laughs> and it was three hours later, I'm like, oh, wow, I just should be working on my sermon on sloth instead of watching. Um, uh, Twitter is wrath, I would say, because, you know, the politics have been the twi Twitter now. It's like everyone is just, you know, it's called X now, and everyone is just 
spewing information without any proper dialogue. So you're just like talking at everyone versus dialoguing. Um, envy could be Facebook. Uh, and then there's the Instagram pride with the pictures and whatnot. Anyway, just a fun little exercise on how these seven de deadly sins manifest in different ways. They even manifest in our technologies, including our social media platforms. I don't know where TikTok would land. It's probably all of the above. Uh, so let us rise as we read the scriptures today. Uh, at Church for the Nations, we honor the word of God. Uh, we preach from the word of God. And when we read the scriptures together, uh, we like to stand in reverence because it is our authority to speak on the matters of God and our understanding of who Jesus is. You cannot know who Jesus is apart from the Holy Bible. So let us read together from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 to 13. Let us all read the two slides and verses together. One, two, three. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with the toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we did not have the right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. The word of the Lord. Be you may be seated. All right, so <laughs> this week was a tough week in sermon prep for me. I don't know if it was the topic. I don't know if it's a spiritual warfare angle where Satan was trying to prevent me from talking about getting his church to move and act and get to work. Maybe it was the June gloom, as we talked about. Maybe there was the seasonal depression I was experiencing. Who knows? Maybe it was just poor diet and no exercise this week, which is the true. <laughs> and also the poor diet was also true. I ate a lot of cheeseburgers this week. Oh, I was right. Father's Day is coming up. I got that father figure. Okay. Um, or it could just be, you know, just I was lazy. And I just didn't feel like working. Or maybe I need to take a break and Sabbath and take a vacation so I miss work again. It could be multiple reasons why I had writer's block this week. Um, sometimes sermons just come to me. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes I discover the sermon as I'm preaching it. It's a true story. I'm just being honest. But you know what this is like. You know, some weeks you're excited to go to work. Some weeks are a drudge. Some weeks are energizing. Some weeks are the opposite of that. Just slothful, just getting through it. But the big idea is no excuses. Get to work. Idleness, when Paul talks about this to the church in Thessalonica, a church he's been to only for a month, by the way. Uh, it's a church that experienced persecution. But he noticed that the culture there was a bit lazy. And what does he do? He models work to them. And he preaches and teaches. He doesn't go around and work every location he finds himself doing missionary work in. But in this circumstance, he did because he wanted to emulate a work ethic. And part of that work ethic is godliness. It's, it's doing life like Jesus wants us to live, to get to work, to see work as a beautiful, God-honoring thing. There's this parable about three uh, builders, carpenters, building a cathedral. And they're laying bricks. And a reporter goes to these three bricklayers. And the reporter asks the first bricklayer, what are you doing? The first bricklayer says, I am laying bricks. The second bricklayer says, I'm building a cathedral. But the third bricklayer says, I am giving glory to God. Do you see your work as giving glory to God? The, the, the catechism of the Westminster Confession says this, man's chief aim is to give God glory and to enjoy him forever. Do you see your work as part of an opportunity to co-labor with God, to give him the glory? 
If you do, if you see purpose behind even the mundane, if you see a calling even in a boring job moment, whether it's data entry or making a phone call or email or a Zoom meeting you don't really want to do, if you see the big why and the importance of the little things as God sees them, it's the number one cure to help us overcome idleness, laziness, sloth. So what is sloth? Is it this cute little thing? No, <laughs> that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about this inability to get to work, to move. Uh, what is sloth? Sloth is someone who's the one hitting the snooze button every day. And they keep hitting the snooze button, not just in the morning, but here's the cliche, pastor, but on life. Are you hitting the snooze button on your life and not waking up and getting to the work that God has given you to do. I don't care if you're a student or if you're retired, there is something God wants you to do right now, this week, this moment, but we just gotta be open to him, seek his will, and do it. Sloth is the sin of not doing what we're supposed to do. Too often, we focus in the church, we focus on the sin of not doing the right thing. You know, we, we steal, we commit adultery, we, we say mean things to each other, we're, we're, we're doing wrong things, we're breaking commands. But when the Bible talks about sin, it's also doing the things that we're uh, supposed to do but don't do it. That is still a version of sin. If we know the right thing to do and we are not doing the good, we are sinning before God because we're out of his will. And sloth is one of those sins where it's secretive. It's easy to kind of be in the background not doing anything because it's not obvious form of sin. It's actually a very subtle form of sin. Laziness is not honoring to God. It's just not. When you look to the apostle Paul's life, you look to Jesus' life, 30 years, he was a carpenter. He was a blue-collar worker. Three years, full-time minister. He was constantly doing the work of the Lord. Uh, we need to be doing the work of the Lord, whether it's in our jobs, whether it's on Sundays, whether we're full-time, part-time in ministry. We all need to do our part and see it as work that gives glory to God. But the reason behind our laziness, our procrastination, our sloth, whatever you want to call it, our idleness, could be different for each and every one of us. And the good news is, if we identify certain aspects of our lives where we're lazy in, that's half the problem. We're being honest, you know? Some people may be lazy in certain parts of their lives, whether it's their physical health, whether it's their career, whether it's their family. There are certain aspects of our lives where we may be idle in. And if we don't acknowledge that we are not doing our all, whether it's serving our wives well, serving our bosses well, serving our children well. If we don't acknowledge that first and foremost, there's no way to uproot the problem. Once we acknowledge that the sloth could be there in our souls, in our hearts, we have to figure out how to uproot it. And the Holy Spirit will help us. Sometimes sloth could be related to a physical illness or depression, That's, I'm not trying to take that lightly. God will help us physically get well. Sometimes it's related to past hurts and traumas. I know the Holy Spirit can help us overcome those past hurts and traumas. Sometimes it is a spiritual struggle. Sometimes it is this fight where you know you're doing the right thing, but oftentimes when you're doing the right thing, Satan wants to show up and it becomes a conflict. In fact, you know you're kind of heading in the right direction sometimes when it is a little difficult. There's different key reasons of why sloth is there, but we first need to acknowledge that it's there if it is there in our lives. And then we need to allow God in the process of healing so that we can be free from the shackles that bind us to do the work and the will of the kingdom. So the church in Thessalonica uh, was a stop that Paul visits with his uh, friend. I think it was Silas. He says the word we, so he's never going at his job solo. I think this is very important because often the case, we kind of send ministers or we send people on these solo missions. But
But scripturally, Jesus always sent the disciples two by two. Jesus sends people in community to do the work. There's no like solo CEO or solo startup guy. There's never that sort of mind in the kingdom. It's always working with people. So the Apostle Paul and Silas, they go to Thessalonica. They notice that it's a lazy culture. Now that might be offensive to certain people, especially American baby boomers who are notorious for being workaholics. You want to understand the culture you're in. Uh, A baby boomer from Soviet Armenia or the Soviet Union is not going to have the same work ethic as an American baby boomer. Certain cultures allow for certain work ethics. Now, maybe there's a negativity with overwork. That that could be a problem, too. that's That's a sermon for another time. That's a sermon on Sabbath and rest. But this sermon is about cultures where people are not doing what they're supposed to do. Now, if my observations are com- correct, if my experience is correct, things have been different since the pandemic. <laughs> Remember everyone giving the COVID-19 excuse for their job? Like people would not do their jobs and just say pandemic. I'm like, the pandemic has nothing to do with the phone call you need to make and the data entry thing you need to do. Don't give me that excuse, please. Do your work. Uh, Work has just been different after the pandemic. There's people being more uh, straightforward with creating boundaries. That could be good. Uh, But there's also a downsize. Um, There's also the reality of technology. What the pandemic did was accelerate the technological trends, right? Remember the time where it wasn't okay to work from home? (laughs) That was three years ago. (laughs) Now it's okay to work from home. Uh, So anyway, some of you know what it's like managing companies, leading people. Uh, uh, It's been a challenge. It's been different. People don't seem to want to work anymore. But there's also the financial realities. There are people who do want to work, and they're working multiple jobs right now just to make ends meet because things are not the way they used to be. It's it's a weird transition time. Work is different. Uh, What we assume will happen in our day-to-day life is not happening anymore. There's a lot of downtrod millennials and young people trying to start a family and they, they're still drowned in student debt and wondering why they need to have multiple jobs. They're not all lazy as baby boomers sometimes label them. It's sometimes quite the opposite. There's a lot of great workers. We don't want to assume anything about anyone or any culture, but we want to encourage people to do the work they all need to do. And it starts with us. Where are we in our work ethic? Is it God honoring or is it not? I remember having a personal coach uh, right before my move here, and one of the exercises she, she gave me was track your time. What are you doing with your time? And it's like, oh, wow, I am watching way too many series on Netflix for three hours in certain parts of the day. Not that it's wrong to have moments of rest and, and entertainment, but what do you track with your time? What do you do with your time? Do you honor God with your time? Sometimes honoring God could be doing a hobby and relaxing. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. But is it always that and not doing anything productive and glorifying to God? Uh, what is your time saying about your spiritual walk, to put it in another way? Does it build cathedrals that give glory to God, or are you just simply going through the motions of life and slowly waiting to die, to put it very bluntly? What are we doing with your time? Is it giving glory to God? Or are we just wasting the precious resource of time, which is a limited resource? The church in Thessalonica was a persecuted church on top of it. They were experiencing early church persecution. And it's interesting, Paul is saying, don't cower in fear while you're being persecuted. But he's actually doing quite the opposite. He's trying to embolden them to do their jobs in the moment of a crisis. It seems counterintuitive, but it's actually quite beautiful because the circumstance may be awful, but even in the awful circumstance, make sure you do your job. Especially in the awful circumstance, do your job well. Also, theology matters. How you view what you do in your day job will affect, um, I mean, what what your theology says about your work will affect how you do your work. Uh, The church in Thessalonica had a faulty view about the end of the world. A lot of the letters Paul addressing 
It's not just the 21st century where people make up weird end times theologies, but it was also in the first century where Paul is rebuking a faulty understanding about the second coming of Jesus Christ. What does this have to do with work? A lot. Um, And I know people like this. You might know people like this. People think that one day Jesus is going to come back, therefore this earth could go to hell in a handbasket. Nothing I do has significance. I'm a Christian. My job is done. I'm just going to wait in my seat. And when Jesus comes back, I go to fly with him in heaven, and that's it. That's a theology that's faulty. That's a theology that doesn't understand that Jesus did not come to help us escape this earth and our bodies, but he came to redeem this earth and our bodies. The end goal is to be resurrected like Jesus. The end goal is new earth, new heaven. The end goal is to be with God face to face as a spiritual body entity as Jesus is currently in heaven with a body in heaven. That's what the Bible says. And anything that doesn't preach a resurrection theology is not Christianity. And so often the church itself doesn't even know what it believes, especially when it comes to the resurrection and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And a lot of it is undermining the theology of redemption and a work because it's subtly saying that our things here and now don't matter as much. No, they matter. They're going to be redeemed. And God is breaking through. Heaven is invading earth to redeem this fallen earth, to lead all things to new creation. Your theology matters, and it matters with church. So the Thessalonian church, poor work ethic culture, they were persecuted, and they had a bad end times theology. Paul's rebuking them and reminding them, look to my example, look to my teachings, and don't be idle, get to work. C.S. Lewis has this book called The Screwtape Letters, and it talks about how Satan's tactic sometimes is not to divert us from doing the will of God in big ways, but in slow, subtle ways. And this is about a demon talking to his nephew about the tactic on how to tempt someone away from doing the will of God or away from the Christian walk. And it says this. This is a temptation in in this book. Uh, C.S. Lewis was being creative and kind of getting in the shoes and the persona of of someone tempting uh, a Christian. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effort is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. So your hobbies. doesn't have to be a big sin. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, with sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. So often people become Christians, and then slowly Satan nudges them away from that passion and calling that they had when they experienced the Holy Spirit for the first time. And it is the subtle, gradual road away from the will of God, away from that narrow path that Jesus paved, that often leads us to focus our work and our energies on the things that don't matter. Things matter to God. Our work matters to God, but it has to be aligned to his will. And we need to constantly check our hearts, check our motives, check our why, so that we could bring glory to God and see our work as an opportunity like that bricklayer, I am giving glory to God in my work. I love the line in uh, this passage. Uh, Paul is literally saying, don't be busybodies, but, but be busy at work. It's straight from the Bible. Don't be a busybody is a, is a Bible verse. What do busybodies do? They have nothing better to do. They really don't. Uh, the person working and, and bringing light to dark places focus on building their families up, their careers, their societies, their serving in the church. They don't have time to be a busybody and gossip, right? When you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you don't have time to be idle and do things that are not productive. Are you a busybody or busy at doing the Lord's work? This is something we all need to ask ourselves, and I need to get a new ringer with this new phone. <laughs> busy body or busy at work? All right. There's a lot of interesting proverbs related to idleness and being a sluggard in proverbs. Um, it's not wise to be a sluggard or a, a lazy person, depending on your translation, or a bum, depending on your translation. Anyway. 
The word is sluggard in the Hebrew. And what does the uh, proverb say? Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? Now, what do ants have to do with productivity? It's interesting, right? Ants are gross. They, they bite you. They, they kind of ruin picnics. Yet, they're constantly moving. They're constantly at work. There's so many ants. There's like quadrillion billion of them. They're old as the dinosaurs. You know that? Ants are, go way back. And uh, they could carry three times their weight. Um, I think that's what makes them you know, a good example for a sluggard. They're, they're constantly moving. They could pull three times their own weight. But I think what really makes an ant special is that they're part of an ant colony and they work in tandem with the other ants. And I think for us as Christians, we need to work in tandem with one another. We need to encourage each other and be surrounded in environments where work is part of the culture and you get excited to do the work. Also, ants have a boss, uh, an ant queen, or I think it's a queen. I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's ant queen. We have a boss of this church. It's not me. That's, like, that's the Netflix cult special. It's not. <laughs> it's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's spirit is with us. Jesus Christ gives us commands. Jesus Christ gives us our callings. He's the head of this church. And we all have a role to play in leadership or non-leadership, but we each have a role to play in serving what the boss wants. And when we are surrendered to him, if we say the word, your will be done, your kingdom come and mean it, we are all connected in a, this community called the church, this family called the church, to do the will of God, to do things that are cool and glorifying, to co-labor with God and do what he wants us to do in this moment of time. The church is his only option for, for, for doing the will of God here. There's no plan B. It's us. It's up to his disciples and the future disciples to do the kingdom work, to bring glory to God, to advance his gospel to all nations. Church, we have a high calling. We have a high why if you're a Christian. You know why we exist if you believe Jesus is alive. We have a big passion and zeal. People are in darkness. They need to know the light. People are hurting and suffering. They need to know that God is a comforter. People are in pain and are meandering aimlessly. And we need to show them the way, the truth, and life that is in Jesus. We need to tell the world to wake up, and it starts with us. Waking up from our sleep, rising from the dead, because Christ's light will shine on us. This is an ancient song in the early church. It's a song that we need to proclaim the world is sleeping. It needs to wake up to the goodness of God. We need to wake up each morning, not hitting the snooze button, but we need to wake up knowing that Christ is with us. Today is the Lord the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us find the passion and purpose of each day. If we don't, we will fall into the trap of sloth and sluggardness and idleness and its sin of uh, uh, omission. We need to make sure we wake up each morning with the excitement and joy of being thankful for this time, thankful for this day, and getting to work. I am really envious of my boys. They, when they wake up, I have a three-and-a-half-year-old, a one-and-a-half-year-old. When they wake up, they're just full of excitement and joy, ready to start their day. And I'm like, when, when was the day where that wasn't me anymore? <laughs> right? Lord, I want some of that. Where, where did that go? There's something inside of me that needs to maybe unpack and confess to the Lord. There is something beautiful when Jesus says, uh, you must be like a child to enter the kingdom of he heaven. There's something enthusiastic about the love of life when you're a child. We need to have that enthusiasm when we wake up and be glad waking up that there's a day for us to do kingdom work. And it goes back to knowing our why. Do you know your why? Do you know why God made you? This is one of the most important philosophical questions we each have to ask. Romans 12, 11 says, Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. What is your why? Why did God make you? What does God want you to do here in the now, in this season of life? What is it? This is a prayer that God will actually answer, very specifically if you allow him. If you need guidance, I would love to pray with you. 
But there is the big why for each and every one of us as Christians because there is purpose behind everything because Jesus is alive. There is a purpose to this world. There's a purpose to this creation. God is not done with his creation. He's, he's in the process of renewing it all. There's the big things like God loves us. We could be with God. That applies to every Christian. But what is it God is calling you to? Sometimes we get so, so caught up with a specific thing and we don't allow for some creativity in that calling. Uh, I was reading a book the other day about sometimes we view the call of God more like a dot or an arrow we need to hit on the mark. But sometimes it's more like a sandbox. There's some creativity. This is the parameter in which God has called you to, but there's more creative opportunities to execute that plan. Sometimes we get so caught up with the calling, the big capital C calling, but maybe God is just wanting us to focus on specific tasks. And those tasks will build itself up for that big calling down the line. It's important for us to know what God wants from us. And this requires discipleship, learning to hear from the Lord. It requires us knowing the basic truths from scripture. Um, we live in a very biblically illiterate society right now. It's really sad. Um, if, if, if I am saying things that are cultish like that Netflix special, there'd be enough people in this church to rebuke me because you guys know the Bible. I would hope it is true. <laughs> but where is the, the Bible? Like, we, where is the biblical literacy? Where is the ability to hear from the Lord? Where is the ability to gather around other brothers and sisters, learning from people who have experience and maturity? There's some amazing careers and people in this space, young people. Meet with them, learn from them, grow and learn from their experiences. We, this is a beautiful church. I love the stories here, the testimonies here, the, the things people have accomplished here for the kingdom and for the society. What is your why in retirement? My dad just turned 80 years old uh, last week. We've had a few birthdays uh, in our community too. Um, and he told me, I think I retired too early. I'm like, why is that? Because I, I don't, I mean, it was tough for me to have my encore career. And he's just trying to figure that out. It was just an interesting moment. For those in that next stage, what is your encore career? I met with Pastor Jim last uh, two weeks ago for lunch. And he's in that process of figuring out his next steps as he retired from this church as a lead pastor and is figuring out his, he, what he called his encore career. Uh, what are you, if you're on the younger side, are you feel lost in your calling and your trajectory? Do you feel like uh, you don't have purpose, which is a common struggle these days? Meet with someone, talk with people, pray to God, meet, meet with older Christians, learn. All I'm saying is there's all these big what if questions but I know God cares about us and he cares about you. And if we just go to him and seek him, he may actually tell you what to do. Um, I know Christians where God has spoken to them to do certain things and they haven't done it. And they're wondering why God stopped talking to me. Sometimes God will not talk to you until you do the task at hand. He'll always be with you, but he may not give you the next command unless you do the current command. So often we think that God doesn't care about our, our, our day-to-day -day struggle. But what is your day-to-day -day struggle? What is your tasks at hand today? Allow God into the process. Allow him to lead. Allow him to help you and uproot any sloth and laziness and sluggardness so that we could be free to be full of love and light and happiness because the Lord is with us. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. There's this Greek mythology of Hades and this river of forgetfulness. It's where we get the word uh, lethargy. And uh, in hell, there's people drinking in this river of forgetfulness. They're kind of liturgic. They're kind of just stuck in their couch. They're stuck in the motions. Do you feel liturgic? Do you feel stuck? If you feel stuck, we have someone who could free us from it all. Jesus Christ. He came to make us fully alive. And the problem with the church is it's not fully alive. It's drinking from the river of forgetfulness of lethargy, of, of, lethargy, of sloth. We need to wake the church up to get to work, to drink from the living waters of Christ. Jesus Christ came into this world to die for the forgiveness of sins. When we accept him into our hearts, we receive the Holy Spirit. We get adopted into God's family. We find our calling and our 
purpose because we are connected to the one who made us. When we are connected to the one who makes us, everything falls into place. We have Jesus Christ as our example. We have church Christians who are older in their walk as examples like Paul and Silas was to the Thessalonian church. There's people who show us what this life looks like. And we need to be connected with God and his people to be fully inspired and full of the spirit. We need to drink from the rivers of life that Jesus provides. Be fresh with the living water that provides us with what we need to do the tasks at hand. Church, are we asleep or is it time to wake up? Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead. Let Christ shine on all of us. What is underneath your sloth? Let us spend some time in prayer. Is there something you need to uproot? Let us spend time asking God to help us uproot it. Is there a spiritual practice we need to implement? Let us implement it. If there's some coaching or some counseling or some discipleship that needs to take place, let's pray that the Lord provide those opportunities for you. The Lord will help us. We just need to be fervent in our zeal and allow the Holy Spirit in. Let's pray. And then we're going to take the Lord's Supper. Heavenly Father, thank you for helping me get through this sermon. Sometimes we feel liturgical, or not, not, not liturgical, whatever it's called. We feel lazy, slothful, just making up words today. Um, we feel like we don't have the strength we need, Lord. The energy level is quite not there. Uh, the, the vision is quite not there. The calling is not quite there. But Lord, help us not lose sight of all this stuff by focusing on ourselves, focusing on our circumstances, focusing on our excuses, Lord. But let us focus on you right now. So in the name of Jesus, if there's anything that we need to uproot from our souls right now, I, help, I hope that you help us confess it and bring it to the light. If there's certain patterns and habits that we need to be mindful of, where we're not good stewards of our times, help us have the willpower needed to do what we need to do right now. So Lord, we come to you right now with our imperfections, with our slothfulness, Lord, and we ask that you uproot any sort of habits and patterns that are not honoring to you. Lord, if there's anyone here who has lost their zeal in service of you, Lord, help bring it back. So often I hear those stories of the new convert who's super excited to serve you, but then Satan comes in and takes away that joy slowly and subtly. Lord, help us remind ourselves of that moment of our first love, that moment when we encountered you for the first time. Lord, I just pray in this new season that we be fervent in our zeal for you. Help us rebuke any habits of our laziness and help us just be all in for the kingdom. Help us see that we're building a cathedral that gives glory to the creator and maker of heaven and earth. Brothers and sisters, every week we go to the Lord's table. It's a table that our Lord Jesus Christ prepared for us on a night of his betrayal. At the cross, our lives have meaning. This world was going to hell in a handbasket and Jesus took that burden upon himself on the night of his betrayal. On the cross, Jesus died for us. He died for you. What motivated him was his love for you. For the joy set before him, he took on the burden of this cross, of putting to death our sin, of freeing us from Satan and his grasp over us, and to usher in life eternal for all of us. That is what motivated him to do the finished work of the cross. On the cross, he said, it's done, it's finished. I've accomplished that which God has set me to do before the foundation of the world. It is finished, guys. Jesus has done it for you. Trust him. Come to him as you eat the bread and drink the wine. Remind yourselves of the once and for all finished work of Jesus Christ. Trust him. 
And when you do, know that he will be with you to do what you need to do this week. On the night of his betrayal, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body given to you. Whenever you eat of it, do it in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup and said, This is the blood shed for the remission of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. For whenever you take and eat, whenever we take and drink, we proclaim our Lord's saving death until he returns and renews all things. We are forgiven in Jesus' mighty name. Welcome to his table.